Kia ora koutou, ko Mark from Research Central Tene. You're listening to the Heritage Talks podcast. Today, family historian Marie Hickey will help you unlock your London-based ancestry, revealing some of the reasons your research may have reached a dead end. So we're starting off with Know Your Boundaries, okay? So up until... 1889, you had the City of London, which is the square mile, um, and it's still colloquially known as the square mile. It had autonomous authority, and that authority extended right up until about 1965. It still has its own police force, um, and it is in charge of its own sort of ceremonial events, like you have the Lord Mayor's show, etc. So this is what sort of made up. So in uh, 1888, a, a parliamentary act was passed and the County of London came into being. So it hadn't existed prior to 1888. In 1900, they split it up into 28 different boroughs, which are shown here. Okay, so you've got Wandsworth, Lewisham, which was in Kent, Greenwich, Woolwich, they were Kent, Deptford, and all round here. And then in here you've got the City of London, the square mile. Okay? So following on, in nine, nine, you can find this on the internet, by the way, um, in 1965, they decided to change it again. So the 28 that we've just looked at, they are what people think of as inner London these days. So that 28 um, became 12 boroughs, but they were larger, covered larger areas. And there were another five boroughs added, which included the City of London. The City of London hadn't been included up until then. So you've got Barnet, Enfield, Harrow, Hillingdon, etc., Bexley, and that. And these, are the, as you can see, these are the different counties. That's what it was, and this big area now is what it is. So, do you see what I mean by you need to sort of know your boundaries? Part of the reasoning for uh, needing to know those boundaries is because your records are going to be scattered. Okay, so you really do need to know where to look. Okay, so this is the City of London. It had over 100 parishes. Okay, so this has come out of Fillimore's Atlas and Index of Parish Registers. These maps have now been, <coughs> excuse me, digitised and put onto Ancestry, so you can view them there if you don't have the Atlas and Index book. We do have the Atlas and Index book here in the library, but you're not allowed to photocopy these parish maps because they're covered by copyright, okay? And this is Middlesex, just so you know. So you've got um, Clerkenwell, I think that's Hackney or something, and, that, and then you've got the City of London just down here. But they're quite, it's quite handy because you can see um, you've got Tottenham and, and Hackney here. But if you want to parish this side, it's hinting you need to look at the map for Essex. And if you've got somewhere down here um, by the Isle of Dogs and that, which is here, uh, you're looking at Kent. And down here, you're looking at Surrey. You're looking at Buckinghamshire over here. And that's these, you know, ma maps are going to be your friend. Okay, uh, I got this off a website called Mapco, and what this is is showing the boundaries of the parishes, which I thought was quite useful because sometimes you might have somebody and you think they're in a particular parish and can't find them. Well, it could be that another parish um, governs that area, and you can... Um, 
make it larger so you can actually see the streets that it sort of governs. The other thing is, are you actually looking for the right religion? We all automatically go to Church of England, but there are other religions around now as there were then. The thing being, um, apart from Jews and Quakers, all other non-conformists weren't recognised. So if the marriage didn't take place in a Church of England church, it wasn't considered legal. So you may be... But it doesn't mean to say they didn't get married in the church of their own faith, but they had to be married in the Church of England for it to be legal. Also, a lot of the nonconformists didn't have their own burial ground, so you may find them buried in a Church of England burial ground. Um, nonconformists uh, sort of weren't recognised until the uh, law change in about uh, 1st of July 9, 1837, when Victoria introduced the um, civil registration. But in 1940, the non-parochial... Sorry, 1840, I got the wrong century. The non-parochial parochial act was passed and the non-conformists were asked to send their registers into the Register General's office, which they did. But what happened was some of the different faiths or the vicar of the, or reverend, whatever you want to call them, um, sent the original register in, but before doing so, they made a tra transcript to hold on for their own archive. So the original registers, <coughs> excuse me, uh, were handed in and they form the uh, series RG4 to RG8 and those are held at the National Archives at Kew, but some of them have been digitised and we'll have a wee look at those. So... Uh, this is Dr. Williams' library, and you may not um, be aware of it, but one of the things with uh, Dr. Williams' library was that for a small fee, a nonconformist or even a, somebody from the Church of England could go along and have a birth registered with them. And it was to avoid the necessity of having the child baptised or christened in the Anglican Church. This met with variable success, but up to 49,000 births were registered with them. It was to uh, be limited to a 12-mile uh, circumference uh, of central London. However, it is known that there are entries for people who lived further out than that. And the registers for uh, Dr. that were at Dr. Williams are, as we said, at National Archives at Kew, and they're in the class RG5, but they are indexed in RG4. So this is just an example of a register from Dr. Williams uh, library, and that's on the website The Genealogist, which is available to you to use free of charge at any Auckland Council library. Okay. Another um, non-conformist group is the Quakers Society of Friends, and they have a library up in Euston Road in London. And again, this is one of their registers, but this time that's on Find My Past. Okay, so as you can see, you've got to sort of go between your different subscription websites to find things. Uh, another one of the nonconformists that you've probably heard of are, are the uh, Huguenots, who were French uh, refugees. They were the Protestants. 
and they, they left France around about 1685 after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes uh, because they were being persecuted by the population, uh, the uh, predominant Catholic population. And they settled sort of around Spitalfields and, and that sort of area is, is known for being predominantly settled by the uh, Huguenots. We do have the Corto series uh, surname index at the research centre and I think we have the full Corto series of the Huguenot series also in the research centre so you can locate that using the library's catalogue. Um, and if we don't have material um, that you're sort of looking for, then, you know, do contact the uh, depositories in the UK that have the material and they can give you further guidance. Uh, we don't have much for the Methodists, but one thing we do have for the Methodists, and if you're looking at Methodists, I do recommend you use it, is the Historic Westminster Roll. And this is a list of signatories of um, people who gave a guinea. And it, its proper uh, name is the uh, Million Guinea Fund, and that ran from the 1st of January 18, 18, 1899 to the 30th of June 1904. So, like, I've got somebody who's on there, they gave a, a guinea, but then it also gives me names of, in this inst in my instance, it was their parents and grandparents whom they were donating the guinea in, in name of. And that's it's a very nice thing to have. And even better, it's usually the donor's signature. So you might not have the donor's signature, that person's signature on any other record, but if you can get it on that, it's well worth looking at. And the, um, the role isn't digitised as yet that I'm aware, but we do have it on microfiche in the research centre. Uh, the largest collection of records for nonconformists if you look at the genealogist, they've got the largest collection and then there are some on fam Find My Past and some on Ancestry. You may even find some on Family Search, who knows. Now, maps. These are going to be exceedingly useful to you um, because we all get lost and uh, maps are the one way of sorting things out. So the British Library has a good selection of, of maps on their website. You can look at them for free, it costs you. We all like that word. The National Library of Scotland has got an excellent um, series of maps for England and Wales, and they cover the years 1841 to 1952, and they're 25 inches to the mile, which means you get a lot of detail. And they're free. Um, you might find some of the sites that you pick up maps on, you can look at them, but you can only increase them to a certain size. After that, you might have to purchase the map or go and see if you can find that particular map on another site. Uh, so this here is John Roke's map, and I think I got that off um, Mapco. So this is part of uh, Westminster. When I was looking at it this morning, I was thinking, that's not right. It's back to front. But as you can see, I mean, if anybody has been to London, you can see all these sort of how many sort of areas here where you've got green areas uh, and that and how built up it is these days. In about 1898, a series of maps was drawn up and it was to indicate the financial circumstances of the population for the inner London area. And they were, they're colour coded. So um, black is really terrible. Okay, they're, they're, that's where all your ba bad people are. It's Booth's maps 
birth poverty maps, okay? And what he did was he walked around in a London with a policeman, a different policeman at different places, and he drew these maps. He colour coded them for financial situation of the population. And the maps and most of the um, notebooks have been digitised and they're on this website up here. You can view it for free, but not all notebooks have been done. So uh, there is a note there if the notebook you want hasn't been done to contact them. So if it's black, it's really bad. If it's blue, it's a bit better, but not much. So um, from memory, I think the yellow was the best and your pink. So the reason why, only reason why I chose this particular area, um, which strangely enough does seem to be a bit of Westminster because you've got some Margaret's up here, is because it showed a variety of different types of uh, finances for the population in that area at the time. See, like Pimlico down here, we've got lots of pink and yellow, so, you know, they're people who are reasonably well off uh, in that. And this is just an example of one of the notebooks, but if we can... OK. Um, so, Laundry Yard, which... Um, it's saying it's narrow, neglected by occupiers, owners, and vestry. The rubbish is a disgrace. It looks like pined children, fat women, always had a bad name, not so bad as it used to be, but if any black anywhere here, so that means it's a, an area he's going to colour in black. One of the lowest places in Westminster, dark blue to dark blue barred by St Peter Street. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this is another map that's, uh, just to show you the variety of maps that you can get, again, this is off Mapco, and uh, this is just a map uh, showing the houses that were destroyed and damaged by the fire in 1748, so it's not the Great Fire of London, it's another fire later on. Uh, the only reason why I chose this was because uh, it was done in 1814. So you can see, even in 1814, this is the East End, Whitechapel area, it's still sort of fairly rural. And we can see with uh, this bit in Westminster, you don't have as much sort of green space as you once had. And of course now, if you go there, it, it's a load of concrete. Okay, so the other thing you're going to be up against is the fact that street names change. So there's a, a couple of things here. To be quite honest, I just put in uh, London street name changes and that might very well bring it up for you. So there is another set for the Hunt House that actually goes prior to 1929. It's, it starts in the 1800s, and for some reason I have not put the dates down, so I can only apologise to you for that. In England, they have what they call local studies libraries, and these are usually attached to the library, so it's sort of like a, a local history library. I suppose in some ways you could say it, in some instances, it's sort of like a combination of special collections here and the research centre. Uh, not necessarily as big. In some instances, they can be quite small. But there may be material held at these local studies libraries that you won't find elsewhere. That for some reason, they haven't been deposited at a big um, archive. So, if you go on to januki.org.uk, um, and again, I, if you want to make it easier, just Google Local Studies Libraries UK and you should get something. But they have a listing on there of uh, local studies libraries. And this is just a selection of some of the websites of some of the local studies library. This is one for Hillingdon out in West Middlesex. Greenwich, which uh, was Kent, 
It's a nice comfy chest for you to go to sleep on. Uh, the Minette Library, which deals with Lambeth. And you can see there's all sorts of things that uh, they have, people, places, subjects, maps, photos, cemeteries. Southwark Local Studies Library, this is actually at the back of the um, library at Borough. And that, they've got a, a very nice room with all sorts of goodies uh, out on the um, open shelves, but there's also lots of stuff out the back as well. And, that, and you'll find that with uh, anything. And another place to look if you uh, haven't done so is Cindy's List. C-Y-N-D-I-S uh, list. And she does things for all sorts of different countries. So if you've not looked at her before, you know, she's done things for New Zealand, Australia, uh, um, all sorts. So it's, it's quite uh, um, a good website to look at. So apart from your local studies, there's three sort of biggish archive uh, places that you might be wanting to look at. So the Guildhall Library, which this is a quite a nice photo here, that's the library there. And uh, you may have seen some things off the Guildhall, with all their beautiful gold and stuff when somebody's going to see somebody. But uh, they look after a lot of the material to do with uh, some of the guilds of London and, and that. However, some of the parish registers and that that they used to hold have now been transferred to London Metropolitan Archives. They have a wonderful selection of directories for the Greater London area. And that. So if you're looking for anything in the City of London, then the Guildhall Library is a good place to look at their catalogue. And that's just a bit of the um, website. So you can see that uh, they have, for family history, they've got apprenticeship records, Boyd's marriage index, census material, occupations, directories, criminals, the London Gazette, so a, a wide-ranging selection. If, like me, you've got people in the city of Westminster, you then need to look at Westminster City Archives. So this is the building in St Anne Street. You go and knock on the, or well, press the bell these days, and you get let in. And again, on their website, they'll tell you about accessing resources remotely. There's information sheets, education and business, finding your ancestors, etc. So Westminster City is the place for you if you've got people down there. Okay. So the big one is London Metropolitan Archives. Now they have the parish registers that covered sort of like the areas that were in Middlesex, because Middlesex is no more. Uh, they've got re registers for Lambeth, Southwark, uh, some of the areas that were out in, in Kent. They have a very good catalogue. So. Um, you know, do use the catalogue. And it's not just parish registers that these places hold. They do hold other material to do with the areas that they are, are covering. So it could be rate books. Um, it, it could be uh, jury lists or electoral rolls or, or all sorts of, of things. You do need uh, readers' tickets for all of them, and I know for the county archives that were on the CARN system, C-A-R-N, um, the CARN card is no more, uh, and they've introduced a new system. So if you've got an old CARN card and you're planning to go to the UK, then you need to take that and check out what other sort of stuff you might need to take to get the card. and also which areas are going to be using it, because I understand some people have decided not to. So we've had a look at some of the archives and that, but libraries have material, as do we here at the Centr Research, Research Central, aren't we? We've just changed our name again. <laughs> 
So we've got a number of CDs of uh, different types of material, so it could be transcripts or the photographed images of parish registers. Uh, we've got some school material, we've got things in books, we've got them on CD, etc. One of the things we've got, it's not on the open shelves, uh, we were talking about uh, Booth earlier on, but back in the 1850s, a chap called Henry Mayhew did something similar, only he didn't do maps. What he did was he went around and he spoke to like chimney sweeps, prostitutes, bun sellers, um, pure sellers uh, and stuff. And pure, for those who don't know, is doggy doo-doo. Okay, so, um, and that's used for the leather trade. So, the pure finder may at once be distinguished from the bone grubber and the rag gatherer. The latter, as I have mentioned, before mentioned, carries a bag and usually a stick armed with a spike, while he is most frequently to meet, be met with in the back streets, narrow lanes, yards and other places where dust and rubbish are likely to be thrown out from the adjacent houses. The pure finder, on the contrary, is often to be found in the open streets as dog wander, dogs wander where they like. Pure finders always carry a handle basket, generally with a cover to hide the contents, and have their right hand covered with a black leather glove. Many of them, however, dispense with the glove, as they say it is much easier to wash their hands than keep the glove fit for use. The women generally have a large pocket for the reception of such rags, as they may chance to fall in with, but they pick up those only of the very best quality and will not go out of their way to search even for them. Thus equipped, they may be seen pursuing their avocation, et cetera, et cetera. This top bit I found fascinating. It's the agencies at present in operation within the metropolis for the suppression of vice and crime. So that goes down to here. So you can see how many agencies were around who were sort of trying to keep people on the straight and narrow. And this is the 1850s. Another book that we've got on the shelf, uh, you can purchase this uh, from the Society of Genealogists, because that's their stamp, uh, Sems and Krems. It is really, really useful because you can work out possibly where your person may be buried, because a death certificate in the UK does not give place of burial. Okay. Deceased online might help, but um, you never know. And so it, it gives the cemetery, um, I'm hoping those phone numbers are, are reasonably correct, because this is the most up-to-date version, and then it gives the address, etc. Uh, the date when the registers begin, and whether or not you are able to go and do the searching yourself, or whether you need to pay them to do it. Okay, so the online sources that you might look at. As we said earlier, um, the genealogist has a large collection of uh, nonconformist registers. Find My Past has the parish registers digitised uh, for Westminster. And Ancestry has the licence with London Metropolitan Archives to digitise the parish registers that they hold. So you're getting things like um, Poplar, Chelsea, um, Marylebone, although that falls within Westminster, so you might get someone ancestry and someone find my past. London Lives is a good website to look at. And that extends from 1690 to 1800. So it's crime, poverty, and social policy in the metropolis. So you get, do you get documents and various um, items on there, well, well worth looking at. It's even got the digital panopticon tracing London convicts in Britain and Australia 1780 to 1925. You can click and see what's new and, and stuff. It's also on Ancestry, I noticed this morning. 
And I did a search. Um, one of my families that's in uh, Westminster, surname is Diggle. So we can see an Elizabeth Diggle giving evidence because her husband, the policeman, has been murdered. So you can see the different types of things that you can get, and that's on London Lives. Okay. The Society of Genealogists, my former employers, they have a couple of websites, so that's why I've put both of them up. So sog.org.uk and societyofgenealogists.com. Uh, if you're a member, you have access to some digitised records. Uh, if you're not a member, uh, then you can't access the records, but you can access their catalogue and various things. And they will do re paid a certain amount. They will do paid research within their collection the same as we will do paid research with things that we can access within our collection or through the internet. So Cindy's list, this is just a, a bit of an idea of, of some of the things that she's got for uh, different areas of Lust London. We can see Dusty Docks here. She doesn't actually have those on her website. These are links to websites. So we can see Dusty Docks is free, but none of the others have the fact that it's free. Find My Pass down the bottom has a dollar sign, which indicates you have to pay for that. British Newspaper Archive. If you've not used this, do. It's a gold mine of, of things. It's the British Library's version of Papers Past. And you get all these wonderful little newspapers on there. So, um, like, it's not the Times uh, and, and, and that you might, for instance, we can see down here, Morning Post, The Evening Standard, London Daily News, Morning Chronicle, The Era, and The Era, of course, being one for the stage. Just as an example, this is part of an, I think it might be actually, it is the whole article. One of my relatives got run over by a, tr he fell off the back of the train that he was um, con conductor on or something. He was the guard, that's what it was. And um, he was killed. But as there's no coroner's report or anything, this gives me a bit of an insight into the accident. But that's what fleshes out your person and you get a better understanding of the lives they may have led. So please do look at British Newspaper. And British Newspaper Archive, if you subscribe to Find My Past, uh, if you've got, I think it's a UK subscription, it comes as part of it, but it's a separate database within the library. So, and all you have to do, you have to register, so all you have to give is your e email address and your password. Simple as that, and then you're in. This is a, another fascinating website uh, that I came across a number of years ago. And it's very good for background information uh, to do with Victorian London. So it's got sections on advertising, architecture, charities, childhood, crime, Death and dying, disease, entertainment, food and drink, hygiene, women, population, professions, the police, photography, organisations, and markets. So it's a very good, good website to use. Family search, you all probably know about that. These days, uh, you do need to have a registration with them. Again, email address and a password. If you then go into the catalogue and if you come across things like these cameras, it means that the record has been digitised. Now, in each case, these cameras have got a key above it, which means it's locked, okay? However, if you go into an Auckland Library's library, you can sit there and look at it. You do need to use the library's computers, though, um, to my knowledge, I don't think you can use your own equipment, whereas with Find My Past, genealogists, that. give it a go using it on your own equipment, but if it doesn't work, do use the library's equipment. 
Okay, so ancestry. So I said I'd include a, a few um, things that you might not think about. It's got gamekeepers' licences. So it's a register of gamekeepers appointed by the Lords of the Manor as deputies with authority to kill game. So you might have somebody who's gamekeeper. You might not know they're a gamekeeper. They've got records there of people who've worked for London Transport. Big employer in London. Some of the other things that are sort of run of the mill, school admission and discharge registers, um, poor law school district registers going 1852 to 1918. If you had somebody who was a metropolitan policeman, they've got um, pensions, 1852 to 1932. The transport staff register we just looked at, 1863 to 1931. Maybe your person was a debtor and ended up in Marshall Sea Prison. Uh, they've got the admission and discharge registers, 1811 to 1842, because the prison was closed. Okay, so this is um, from Find My Past, and this is Percival Boyd. It's a collection from the Society of Genealogists, and it covers 1200 to 1946. Uh, it sort of started with... Um, the inner London area, but it has, uh, with when the family units were done, um, which forms the latter part of it, it was people who had a strong interest in that area. So apparently there's things where it could be somebody in Canada uh, and, and stuff. But I would stick with the, the London bit. And there's a big explanation about them on Find My Past on the uh, page. For it. You're going to get electoral records on both Find My Past and Ancestry, and I think also on the genealogist. The electoral rolls aren't like what we use. So um, the fact that they have been digitised makes it so much easier to research because it's done in an electoral district and then they're divided up into wards and within that ward it's streets. So you actually really, if you're looking at the books, you need to know where they are or you're just having to turn over page after page looking for the family name you're looking for. Rate books. So this is the Poor Law Rate Book and this is on Find My Past again. Uh, it's Westminster so I couldn't figure out why it wasn't coming up under London. It was because they've put it in under as Westminster. And they do have some for Southwark as well. And that, so these are quite useful because uh, they're done annually. So it's people who have a certain amount of income, etc., and they're going to pay this tax so that the church can dole out money to the people in the area who, who need assistance. But because these are done annually and your census is done um, every 10 years, you can sometimes see people moving around the area. And that. so if you've got people who appear in these, that can be very useful. Uh, Bethlehem Hospital, which is now the Imperial War Museum, uh, this is just a little wee bit out of a, a, a case book. There are two uh, data sets on Find My Past for the hospital. One is browsable and the other is name searchable. So you might have to do a wee bit of work if you think you had somebody in there. But there are case books. So um, it does say down here, this man has escaped from another asylum and has been brought to Camberwell House. He is obstinately silent, refuses food, takes no interest in his surroundings. Some of you may be aware that the genealogist has tithe maps for England and, and Wales on it, but they don't seem to include the inner parts of London. I tried that this morning. But what they're doing, uh, and it is piecemeal, so you might have to wait a while, is in 1910 or 1911, Lloyd George uh, did what's known as Lloyd George's Doomsday Book and did uh, a big sort of survey of, of the country. And uh, maps 
were, were made. So what the genealogist is doing is putting the, digitising the maps and putting them up online, and eventually my understanding is that they want to then be able to link it to the 1911 census entry. So this is um, one of the maps. I, uh, they've done about half a dozen areas in London. Paddington, I know, is one of them. Again, a nice map to have because if you can sort of see where your person was on census night, that's always nice. My heritage tends to sort of be quite general. And that, but you can get uh, photos and that, uh, it's more indexes than anything anything else, but it's still worth looking at uh, for your families. And um, just a couple more books that we've got in our collections. I got we do have a borrowable copy of this. Uh, back in 1912, I think it was Maud Pember Reeves, William Pember Reeves' wife. Uh, she and some other ladies went around uh, parts of Lambeth and were trying to help the poorer people. And uh, they were keeping records. They asked the people to keep records. And this work, round about a pound a week, is absolutely fascinating insight if you've got poorer people who were in that sort of area. Uh, it covers things like uh, food, clothing, their budget, how they sort of spent the money, the fact that the husband comes home dirty from work and doesn't take his shoes off, he goes to bed and he's black from head to toe, what the, how the mother spent the day, um, things about the children, thrift of the people, fascinating read. We also have... Um, if you're into the macabre, The Grim Almanac of George in London. This is borrowable book from um, the next floor down, although I think I got this one out of the basement. I'll just read one entry, and it's not gruesome, I promise you. So what they do is it's month by month, but for each month it's several years. So this is an entry for the 6th of January in 1727. In early January of this year, the lunatic king was first admitted to St. Giles' workhouse. This poor man became convinced that he was a king and immediately appointed another lunatic as his prime minister, personal barber and servant. Sadly, however, one day the prime minister got so hungry he ate his dinner before the lunatic king had come in which made the king so angry that he attacked the prime minister on sight. The exiled prime minister shortly afterwards died of a fever and the king, broken-hearted, refused to eat. He died of starvation a few weeks later. Marie is based in the Research Centre at the Auckland Central Library where there is an extensive collection of family history resources available to help you on your journey of genealogy. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for tuning in. The Heritage Talks podcast is produced regularly for your education and enjoyment.